Thought Leadership from PwC's National Office. Hello, and welcome to PwC's Accounting Podcast. I'm Heather Horn. Today, we're back for our second episode on the accounting for software costs. In today's episode, we cover the model for internal use software. This guidance can apply to any type of company that uses software for internal purposes, which is most companies these days. So there's something in this podcast for everyone, including some updates on the latest FASB project on this topic. The reality is software is pervasive in all businesses. Like think of all these platform companies that operate some sort of a uh, on, online marketplace mm-hmm. or connection interface. Like their whole business is built on this technology platform. Now, I don't think people who use those services necessarily think they're buying software or they're buying software as a service, but their experience and the reason why they are attracted to use that company's services because of the software platform. So there's big money being spent there, right? It's driving the business. That was Pat Durbin, a deputy chief accountant in PwC's national office, who's joined once again by Mike Coleman, a partner in the national office. If you heard our last episode on software costs, you'll know that they have some great insights to share. Unlike last week, we don't have a cliffhanger here, so you may not be surprised by the answers, but there's definitely a lot to learn. So stay tuned as you'll definitely want to hear what they have to say. Pat, Mike, welcome back for the second part of our two-part series talking about software costs. And after last week's dramatic ending, it'll be interesting (laughs) to talk about what we're seeing today. And in particular, I know in today's episode, we're going to focus on the sort of other path of our model and talk about internally developed software. So again, we always like to start off sort of level set, tell our listeners why this is important. So Pat, I'll go to you with that first. Yes. I mean, as we were talking about in the externally marketed discussion, we talked about this evolution of software being delivered sort of through licenses to software that companies would run on their own servers to much more of a software as a service or cloud solutions where large, you know, cloud providers, software providers are basically hosting and running the software applications for their customers which in theory, if that was exclusively your business, you would be in the internal use software model. And the internal use software model wasn't really designed for that type of business. It was designed for companies building their own information systems to sort of run their back office. It was never really designed for this sort of commercial-facing application. The other evolution or development um, we've been hearing a lot about lately is the whole development of AI tools. And so understanding what your particular development efforts are relative to AI, how you're planning to deploy them, will also guide what you do with some of those costs in the context of, of software development. So I think that's probably really the two big reasons why this is a timely topic. And Mike, can then you define what constitutes an internally used software, internal use, and then differentiate it? Sure. Um, So internal use software is software that's developed or acquired solely for the company's internal needs. So the software itself is not sold, leased, or marketed. The output of the software is sold, leased, or marketed. And that differs from externally marketed software, which is designed to be marketed to external customers. Okay, so it gets a little confusing because we know a lot of software um, and we can think of different office productivity tools that are sold to us and marketed to us. And some of them we get on our machines and some of them we use and we don't get on machines and some we don't even know if we get on our machines. And it seems like they're marketed to us. Mm -hmm. Yet some are internal And some are external. And it's really this notion of internal is satisfying the entity's own needs. Now, this gets to I'm satisfying my own needs because I'm not transferring possession to my customer. Okay. There's this big focus on why is the focus on possession so important? And it's one of these accounting quirks. Okay. So, If I tried to figure out internal software, and the best example would be maybe a tax prep software that 
used to exist or that still exists, right? And we used to go or, or an office productivity mm-hmm. tool and we used to go to a store and get a shrink wrap box and yeah. load it in our machine and, and we have possession of the software. And then once, you know, the cloud and internet all started going, that same software company said, oh, just put an account online and pay the same price and use. The question was, well, paying it, putting the software online and the company keeping the software and allowing you to use it, that's a service. So how do I distinguish from when I am marketing, selling, licensing from providing a service? Because providing a service is only an internal use. It's the backbone to the service I'm providing. And we get to this notion of possession because we can't say I transfer ownership. The software company is never transferring ownership Mm -hmm. of the code to you. They maintain the license rights to the code. They give you the right to use the software. Ooh, lease accounting. Yeah, but you can't apply lease accounting because lease accounting is only for tangible Mm -hmm. products, not intangible products. So the accounts were left with, well, I can't use ownership as a measure to figure out whether I'm transferring or marketing. I can't use right to use because that I can't use in lease and using my software on my server is still the right to use. What am I going to use? They left with possession. You get to possess the code put it on your servers or somebody else's and not deal with the vendor. That's when you're in the externally marketed world. The internally used world is when you never give your customers the right to take possession and use your software. So Mike, maybe before we keep going today, because it's nagging me, we ended the last episode talking about the fact that the externally marketed model is not changing, the internal use model is, is changing the name Part of that, because it's not it's it's hard for me to reconcile the fact I'm calling it internal use and yet I'm licensing it and spreading it, you know, throughout the world. Yeah, they're not changing the name of internal use. Okay. Right. Right. They're keeping the notion of whether you're giving the customer the right to possess the software, meaning it's internal or not. And the reason they're doing that is because it's difficult to figure out the line of when you, a customer is using the software versus what's back office and internal in the stack. So mm-hmm. let me try to explain that a little. If you go to an airline and you go and use the reservation system, is that internal use software or externally marketed software? A customer is using it, but that's not what you're using it for. You're using it to buy a plane ticket. You're just using their software. But I'm not paying you to use the software. That's the difference. At least that I see. I, I get it. Yeah. Uh, uh, true. Not true. Dire- not directly. Right? Yes. That's fair. Fair. That's a very fair point. True. True. But it's that notion of software is powering the service that I'm providing. The classic example in the guidance is I have software on telephone telephone switches and you use the service of using the communication software. That's the backbone to the service that we're providing. So that notion is still going to exist. Internal use is software that I use in the traditional back office sense, Mm -hmm. accounting that only my employees are going to use. But it's also software that can be used by customers, but they don't possess it. It's still a service. And they make the distinction of... It remains a service if you don't give possession of the code to the customer. Okay, so basically look aside maybe from these very brief descriptions and think about you're in the external model if you are transferring something physical or a disk or a, well, the, it's code. Not a, the, the code. code. Yes, the code. thank you, the code. <laughs> Otherwise, you're in the model we're going to talk about today that is called internal, even though external parties may use it. So. Right. And I think the other thing, too, just because to, it gets a little bit confusing, even when we're running through some of these examples. Yeah. So we're focused here on the party who is really developing the software. There are also people who purchase either the software or the functionality of the software, and they have to make a decision, too, as to whether or not they're getting possession of the software, because then they're basically kind of in the internal use model because they're now buying the software to use themselves. So one person's externally marketed is the consumer's internal use. But then they also have to think about it through this lens of, well, am I getting the software or am I just getting a right to it? Because if I'm getting the software, the idea is I have an asset now and I may be able to attach some cost to it. 
if I'm just getting a service, we normally don't get to attach a bunch of other costs to a right to a service, right? Now, there is some guidance. It's built off of the internal use model. If you're buying sort of a large scale hosted solution, but I think it's just important to also remember which which side of this equation you're on as you're thinking through the model. All right. I think that's actually a great point, Pat, and very helpful. And I definitely think understanding the accounting is, is really the key to hear them because obviously – the fact that there are two different models means that you know we need to understand this differentiation. So now that we've level set which model we're in, Pat, can you give us the basics? Sure. So unlike the externally marketed model that we talked about last week, in the internal use model, we have different um, stages of software development that are defined, right? We had this one key decision point in the externally marketed model, am I a technological feasibility or not? In the internal use model, and again, this is harking back to the days where it's like, okay, I'm going to go build an ERP system to run my business, but we had something called the preliminary project stage, the application development stage, and then the post-implementation of the operation stage. So costs incurred in the preliminary project stage, a lot like you know R&D, conceptual formulation, evaluation of alternatives, we'd expense those costs as they're incurred. Once we get into the application development stage, we're doing some more specific design, coding, installation, testing the software. You can think of that like cost akin to like a self-constructed asset, right? And those we would capitalize then, put them on the balance sheet as some sort of a long-lived asset. And then any costs incurred after we sort of put the system to use post-implementation and operation, those are just operating costs and we would expense those as incurred. I think the big distinction between the two models, at least as they exist today, is that it's usually a lot easier to conclude that you've gotten to the application development stage and therefore should begin to capitalize costs than it is to demonstrate technological feasibility. So I would say very high level, if you're in the internal use model, you're probably going to end up capitalizing a lot more costs than you would in the externally marketed model. All right. And so I know, I mean, we talked about this a lot in the last episode, how it's maybe difficult to line up the actual software development with these accounting terms. But in this case, then, Pat, how would I know if I'm in the application development stage or, or what are some of the indicators, perhaps, and then which costs are eligible for capitalization? So the standard basically says to get to the application development stage, you need to have three things. You've um, completed all the preliminary project stage activities, whatever those are. This is probably the big one. Um, management has authorized and committed to fund the project. And then the third one, it's probable that the project will be completed. So probably goes hand in hand. If management's authorized and committed, it's likely that you're going to complete the project, right, if you're going to get to that point. So that's the point at which you would begin to capitalize. So it's that notion of like, hey, it's probable I'm going to do the work um, and I'll eventually get it to do what I need it to do. Um, so I start capitalizing. Very different from this notion of technological feasibility where I'm trying, I want to build this tool, I want it to do what I think it's going to do, but I don't know yet if I'll eventually get there. In terms of the cost that you can capitalize, um, the standard in the internal use model is much more specific than the externally marketed model. And it talks about um, the external direct cost of services. Again, if you think back to when people were putting ERP systems in, they probably hired a lot of consultants, you know, IT specialists, their own payroll costs of people they have in-house, maybe their own IT folks doing some interface coding, that sort of thing. And then again, again, to the self-constructed asset model, interest that you incur during the construction phase or the build phase would be eligible for capitalization as well. All right. That's helpful. And then how about cloud computing? So like when we're talking about like a hosted ERP or something like that, as given that that's a service, then is that all expense or how does that work? Yeah. So I, I, again, if you enter into that cloud computing arrangement, of course, you always want to make sure if you're going to have the right to take possession of the software, because that would tell us that there's a license in there. But assuming that there is no right to take possession of the software and it's a service, then Basically, that service doesn't generate an intangible asset. So there would be no software intangible asset and liability to record. Now, having said that, 
the standard does allow for certain types of upfront costs associated with entering into a cloud computing arrangement, in particular implementation costs. So that's a, you know, a set of activities, either configuring or uh, customizing your environment to be able to handle the service. Those types of costs can be capitalized. And when you enter into a cloud computing arrangement, the interesting thing there is those costs from a presentation perspective are not presented as intangible assets. They're presented as deferred costs or other costs. And from an income statement perspective, they get amortized to the same line that the ongoing cloud payment gets accounted for. So wherever that cloud payment, wherever line the income statement that goes, these upfront costs would get deferred to there. And then on the cash flow perspective, they would be considered operating cash flows, not investing cash flows as if you were buying an, in, an intangible asset. So this is this accounting quirk that Mike was alluding to, right? We don't have an asset, mm -hmm. so we can't attach costs to the asset, but it was sort of an acknowledgement that the nature of the activities when you enter into one of these cloud computing arrangements or hosted solutions is very similar to the cost you might incur if you were installing that same system on your own server. So it was sort of a, I'll say, an accommodation of the accounting standards to deal with the business reality. Yeah, I think that makes sense, especially since we've talked before that the exact same software, maybe you can actually access either way. So with that said, then, Mike, we talked about this a little last time, AI. does How does AI interact with this model? Right. So again, AI, you make that, if you make the determination, you're going to be developing AI software to be used internally in whatever fashion that is, in, but internally only. Uh, the interesting thing here is it's the, the ultimate outcome will be very similar to our discussion in an external model in that the basic software that you're developing is going to follow the internal use model the major cost that companies incur in developing is that data cost to train the AI model. And typically that data cost is going to have alternative uses and be considered its own asset under 350 as its own intangible asset. So a very similar answer, whether you're doing AI for external, internal, as it relates to the data cost. The regular software cost, that'll have a a different different accounting. Okay. So basically, don't get overly excited that it's AI. Right. It's it's still the same accounting model. <laughs> is what we're saying. Is, is that fair? Yes. All right. So then, with all that said, I as you've been talking, I've been thinking of some of the practical challenges. But I always like to hear. I know you're talking a lot to engagement teams and otherwise, Mike and and clients. So what are some of the challenges we see? Yeah. So the biggest challenge that we see is. As Pat described, how the model works is it's very stage-oriented. So the guidance is stage-oriented, the, the preliminary planning stage, application development, post-operation stage. Today's development is more agile, and companies use agile to develop software for SaaS purposes mm -hmm. and even use agile to a certain degree for their back office type of, of stuff. And the agile development process doesn't lend itself to having stages. <laughs> so you're doing sprints, planning, a little bit of coding, and then you're going back to planning, and then a little bit more coding, going back to planning. And, and it's this continuous cycle in the agile development world where multiple things are going on at different times. So the difficulty becomes, okay, how do we exit planning and enter application development stage when our planning keeps going right, and, and there's all, all different judgment points? Yeah. So that's the question we get all the time. What do we do for this in agile development? And, and what do we do? Well, <laughs> so what we, we call, what we coach our, our clients to do is say, okay, well, look through what the definition of the standard says relative to capitalization. Have you exited planning? And meaning have all of your major planning activities been completed yet? So if you're in this agile development process and all of your planning isn't done, you haven't fully exited the planning process, 
you probably haven't hit that capitalization trigger yet. If you happen to have all your planning process done and now you're figuring out where your coding is and which functionalities you may keep and which you're not going to decide to keep, then the question is, all right, you have to determine management committing the funds. We can talk about that in a second. That one's pretty easy because management does commit the funds. The question then is, is it really probable I'm going to have the software that I planned fully executed? And oftentimes companies can can argue or, or, or will demonstrate, well, no, I don't, I don't know that it's probable yet that I'm going to have this software that I plan put into service. It's still going to change. And other types of software that are being developed, it's maybe there is only one path and you've got it pretty much locked and you get to that probability point a little earlier. So that's what we try to coach folks. You can't well, it's agile, so expense all. It's agile. Well, yes, no, this is the standard we have until it maybe gets changed. <laughs> but the, you have to do your best shot at it and really figure out, is all my planning done, management committed the funds, and what I've planned, am I going to put it into service? Am I my problem? And any other than sort of big sticking points that you see? Yeah, so other, uh, a, a couple of things, unit of account, gets to be a, a, a big practical challenge with the standard. And this gets to the management having uh, authorized the funding. W when the guidance was written, back to Pat's point, it was talked about ERP. Okay, mm -hmm. well, management committed to the single ERP system. Go do it and don't come back until you, <laughs> you yeah, have something. Get it done. In, in today's world where we're talking about a lot of different functionality and a lot of different software applications that are commingled, oftentimes companies will authorize spending of 10 to 15 different types of functionality, hoping that they get one or two hitters. So then the question becomes, okay, well, what's my unit of account? Is it each of the 15? Because in each of the 15, getting to one or two nothing's probable or is the failures a cost of my success and I should look at the the project at a higher level. Um, so that's another big question and difficulty in applying the standard at what unit of account are we talking about when things are different and interrelated. Th those are probably the big thing. Maybe the last one would be oftentimes in the development cycle here, particularly with SaaS, you know, there's ongoing service updates and patches and maintenance and things that happen. And when you decide, hey, a customer came in with some issue, I'm fixing their issue, is that maintenance? And well, at the same time, they've given me an idea, so I've started on the next functionality and I'm doing both of them at the same time. Is it maintenance post-operation or is it part of the beginning? Where does that that end? So that's another issue that we deal with practically. Yeah, so then, Pat, I think from your perspective, it's, you take a step back and sort of think about this, especially in the broader context of, as we think about standard setting and otherwise, what does this mean then from a practical point of view, sort of this misalignment of the model with what we're seeing actually happen in practice? Yeah, well, I, I think what it means is, if you look at the reporting outcomes across a lot of different companies, because they will have all made some different judgments and different decisions in terms of all those different considerations that Mike just laid out, the reporting outcomes are going to be very different. And that creates a comparability challenge for the people who use the financial statements to try to figure out how software costs are really affecting the financial statements. We've talked about this kind of in the context of the call it pure play software developers, whether that was licensing software or developing software as a service, or the other school or the other camp of like companies just building ERP systems. Well, the reality is software is pervasive in all businesses. Like think of all these platform companies that operate some sort of a, a on, online marketplace mm -hmm. or connection interface. Like their whole business is built on this technology platform. Now, I don't think people who use those services necessarily think they're buying software or they're buying software as a service, but their experience and the reason why they are attracted to use that company's service is because of the software platform. So there's big money being spent there, right? It's driving the business. 
And I think there's a real need for users to get information about what costs are being incurred to to develop those platforms. So I think that's really, well, probably the modernization concept, but also just the pervasiveness of software is really what's led the FASB to sort of put this topic you know, back on their agenda. Yeah. And I guess, Pat, then, I mean, we've alluded to this a few times, but coming out of the agenda consultation, we did see this come onto the agenda, but can you kind of fill in the gap there of the history? Yeah. So I think it, it came from a couple of different directions. One was this notion of hey, there's potentially a lot of value that companies possess that's not anywhere on their balance sheet because it consists of the software they use, deploy, sell, but it was all internally generated. The model for capitalization doesn't really sync up with the way software is developed, so are we missing big assets from the balance sheet? Or do we have a model that just feed so much diversity in practice that it's really not that helpful to users. So I think those were the two primary motivations for taking the project on. I think as they got into doing the work, doing the research coming out of the agenda consultation, they spent a lot of time talking to practitioners, talking to users to really understand what are the challenges. And I think that's led them maybe to a conclusion that it's going to be very challenging to come up with a cost capitalization model that kind of works for all applications that's really going to give the users what they want. It's really more about can we at least align the the model or the words in the model a little bit better with the way maybe software is being developed to accommodate the current current model. So, Mike, I know you're on the working group that's been working with the FASB on this. So can you give us sort of a sneak peek of some of the directionally what we are seeing coming out of the work? Yeah, sure. So the the project is now focused on making targeted improvements to to 350, 40 internal use uh, standards. So in, in, in June, the FASB, you know, had tentative decisions about some of the targeted improvements they're going to make and have asked the staff to go and, you know, write that, uh, write the, write the new standard up and have a 90 day exposure period, which we're expecting to that to happen probably sometime in the early fall, uh, September time. All right. And what are some of the targeted improvements that we can expect to see? Yeah. So first and uh, foremost, Um, One of the improvements is eliminating the notion of stages in the standard. So, you know, this notion of preliminary planning Mm -hmm. application, just no more standards, (laughs) no more, no more stages. Right. So that's going to be eliminated. Um, There will be a comment that says, oh, by the way, if you plan with stages, you still don't have to, the accounting's not going to map to stages. Right. So if you happen to be doing a linear approach. You don't apply the old yeah, stage model. Yeah, you don't model. get to keep There's that. No stages. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the, the next probably uh, biggest thing is they're going to look to streamline or try to make it a little clearer the evaluation of uh, probable. Uh, probable's, uh, you know, what companies have been dealing with. But they're really going to add the notion of unresolved high-risk development issues and significant development uncertainties in the evaluation of probables. Let me talk about what those are. Unresolved high-risk development issue is basically when you're developing something novel, unique for the first time, and it's more R&D-like, and that would be an indicator that it's not probable you're going to, you're not probably going to finish and you haven't hit that point of capitalization yet, again, given that it's novel, unique, and R&D-like. And then significant development uncertainties really get to this notion of I'm still not finished with my plan of how I'm going to do this. I may have an idea of what I want to accomplish, but I'm not really sold on all the detailed functionality and how I'm going to get there. And until those uncertainties are resolved, likely I'm not at the probable Scenario, and I probably shouldn't use likely and probable <laughs> in the same sentence, which is a little bit of a segue to my next thing. The FASB in this 
um, standard, I think, will make the statement that probable is meant to be the probable in the master class, right? Which not, makes things a, a lot new easier. Yeah, probable. <laughs> yeah, I think that's helpful from a, a, an accountant's perspective to have that. So, Mike, one of the things also um, that you mentioned earlier is that the cloud implementation costs are under the same model. So, are we going to see some more guidance on that? Yeah. So. There wasn't a lot of discussion about what's going to happen with that as 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 the project went on. The expectation is if the stages in the internal use standard go away and that looks at that standard, um, is there going to be some adjustment to what that is? So there hasn't been a lot of discussion, so we're going to look to see what the exposure draft says relative to to those cloud costs. All right. So definitely, though, a lot of changes. Maybe before I ask you the potential impact, were there any changes you thought we might see that ultimately, and obviously we don't know exactly what's in the exposure draft and there's still that whole process, but any anything coming from the working group that surprised you from what um, we're expecting? I, so actually, what I was expecting was a lot more discussion about disclosure actually. And um, there was a lot of discussion of disclosure, but what I, what I think the FASB is going is modifying the disclosure in the cash flow as a way to... I'll give more information. Give more information about, and Pat mentioned this before, what people are interested in is how much is spent. And so that's a place to do it is to go into the cash flow. So I thought there would be a lot more disclosure discussion in there and it wound up not being so. Well, the financial statements are already getting very long, so perhaps <laughs> perhaps that's a good thing. So then what do we think then will be the impact of these changes? Again, if the model we see in the exposure draft is what you talked about and then obviously depending what comes out of that process. Um, I, I think what will wind up happening is there will be less software capitalized so I think the expectation is, is once you start adding into uh, the evaluation of probable, the notion of high-risk development issues and uncertainty and make that a little more clear, um, I think there'll be a natural tendency for companies that develop software to sell externally and develop same or similar software for internal use, that they're looking at that the same way as to what is probable that's going to get you know, completed. And so I think there will be a tendency to have less. Some companies may come draw, come to the same conclusion they're getting to now with their um, evaluation of probable, but it's more likely that some or enough companies are going to move to a later in the stage that it becomes probable. So less will be capitalized. So then, all right. So there's definitely a lot to think about. In the meantime, companies still have to keep uh, applying the current model we have. So, Pat, from your perspective, what should those companies be focused on? Well, I do think it's um, – we'd always encourage companies to pay attention to ongoing standard setting, especially for something like this that's potentially going to you know, change a model that's been around a long time. If it's some place you spend a lot of money, I would definitely say pay attention and, and think about whether it makes sense to provide – a comment to the to the FASB or if nothing else, just kind of stay tuned to the changes that they're making because it will require some response from a process and control perspective. Um, so I think just you know sort of generally uh, paying attention to the ongoing uh, project is important. All right, and then maybe Mike to wrap things up. You talked about potential exposure draft maybe coming early fall, and then probably a ninety day comment period. So, do we have any sense though of the timeline of what may happen after that? I, I think the notion is to apply it prospectively. Um, I think that's where they'll go. If you know, I, if you get ninety days and get in the fall, I, you know you. You'd think maybe it's targeted towards beginning next year. Yeah, had a lot of talk, had a lot of discussion, and it's targeted improvements. And in most cases, companies are going to want to apply them. Right, <laughs> right, right. So it's like they, yeah. they want, and that's partly why I asked, like, how quickly do we think? So next year, maybe we'll I, see a new standard. I would standard. think so. Yeah, that's, I think this sounds like that's probably good news then for our listeners. Yeah, I mean they've got a pretty packed. Uh, pipeline right yeah, now of new fair. standards. So I think you know, realistically, the earliest they're going to get a standard out the door would be sometime probably in sort of closer to the middle of 
25, but Mike's right. I mean, there, there could well be an opportunity for, for early adoption. And I think practically speaking, it would be almost impossible to do uh, any kind of retrospective yes. yeah. model no. for this. So I think it's, it's going to be perspective. So Yeah. Well, definitely a great topic. Sounds like I'll need to have you guys back to give us an update. But as always, such a pleasure to talk to you. And thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks. And that's our show for today. Tune in next week for more fresh episodes so that you never miss any of our audio content. Follow the PwC Accounting Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And to stay up to date on all our latest accounting and reporting news, sign up for our newsletter at viewpoint.pwc.com. From Thought Leadership at PwC, I'm Heather Horn. Thanks for tuning in. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates, and they sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com slash structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors, including accountants and lawyers.